you have your Bibles, let me invite you to uh, open with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. You know, I had no idea Brother Darrell could sing. Last Sunday, I had the privilege of preaching for him at Butler Baptist, and um, he opens up the service by saying, Oh, Lord, my God. And then he just gives a, an acapella rendition of how great thou art. I thought, I've known Brother Darrell for, you know, 13 years, had no idea he could sing. So if you can't preach after that, you don't have any preaching. Amen. Well, how many of uh, you all here are going to be preaching tomorrow morning? How many of you all are going to be in church and uh, plan on hearing preaching tomorrow morning? Well, I want to open up by just asking you a very pointed question. I'm excited to be here. And uh, I believe the Lord's given me a word this morning. For those of you who are going to be preaching tomorrow morning, how many of you all are just chopping at the bit and can't wait to get behind a pulpit and shuck the corn? Amen? Amen? Yep. Now, how many of you all who are going to be hearing preaching in the morning cannot wait to get to church to hear what God has to say through the man of God who's going to be delivering the word? Amen? Amen? Now, listen, I understand. We are in the middle of uncertain times. And I understand that it is easy at some points of our lives and ministries to face discouraging times. I know that there are some pastors and preachers who are just kind of being, uh, being pulled from both ends. I've heard about men who have been forced to resign from their church because half their congregation has said, I'm not coming back unless you force people to wear masks. And the other half are saying, no, you can't make us wear a mask. And it's caused division in the church. And I know some uh, pastors and church members are discouraged because when they show up tomorrow morning, there may be 50% or fewer than what they're used to in pre-COVID times. But I want to remind you of something that I have a tendency to forget. That uh, it is an extraordinary privilege to stand behind the sacred desk and to deliver the word of God. And I want to also tell you it is an extraordinary privilege to be able to go to the house of God and hear the very word of God himself being exposited by a God called man who serves as your pastor or who is uh, preaching. And, um, you know, that's really the only thing that we have to offer people, but it is everything that we could possibly offer them. And so if you're here this morning and in the honesty and secrecy of your heart, you can say, you know what? I'm not as fired up to preach tomorrow as I was, say, 20 years ago. Or maybe as uh, I would have been 40 years ago when God called me to ministry. I'm not as excited to go to church and hear the word tomorrow morning as I ought to be. Maybe as I was five years ago or 10 years ago or 20 years ago. I just want to remind you of some central biblical doctrine, some central biblical truth that uh, should compel us to show up tomorrow morning with a fire in our guts ready to preach the word of God and ready to receive the word of God. Amen. Let's take a look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. I want to read verses 16 and 17. And when you found your place there, let me invite you to stand in reverence for the reading of God's holy, inspired, infallible, inerrant, authoritative word. 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 16. The apostle Paul writes these words. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. This morning I want to preach to you about the book that should set your soul on fire. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. Uh, it is really all that I have to offer your choice servants here this morning. Uh, but Lord, I know that it is all that we need. And so, Father, we pray for your presence to be here in a very strong a way. We want to sense that you are here with us. And, Lord, we invite you to search our hearts. I pray that if there's anyone who is struggling, uh, that, Father, you can bring that soul great encouragement 
If there's anyone here who is fired up, that you would just fan that flame so that they can uh, have their passion exponentially increased. Uh, Lord, I believe that we all join our hearts together this morning and we say we need you. We want to hear from you. And so, Lord, have your way with each one of us individually and with us corporately during this sacred preaching moment. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. You know, there is no purpose or no plan that is more fundamental to the Christian life and more primal to uh, faithful pastoral ministry uh, than to hide this holy book deep within the recesses of your heart and to rightly divide the word of truth in front of God's people on Sunday mornings. In fact, Southern Baptists have made the doctrine of Scripture a first-tier truth of the highest order. Now, I know Baptists aren't necessarily known for being charismatic people, but if you show up to a Baptist gathering and you tell people that this is the holy, inspired, infallible, inerrant, authoritative word of God, you're going to get some Baptists on shouting ground. Amen? And if you can get a Baptist to shout, you're doing pretty good. But I want to remind you of something this morning. Affirming the Bible as the Word of God is one thing. But applying the Bible like it's the Word of God is another thing altogether. You know, Southern Baptists are really good at affirming the inspiration of Scripture. But sometimes we can fail to implement the instruction of Scripture which is just as important. If the Bible is not internalized and implemented, then it does you no good to say that the Bible is inerrant without any mixture of error. Now, I know that uh, in the middle of these uncertain times, it can sometimes seem extremely laborious to drag yourself out of bed on Sunday mornings and go to a little church house where the people are not excited, where the people are just kind of going through the motions and a routine, it seems like. But folks, I want you to know something, and particularly to the pastors and preachers. I am not here to beat you over the head with a spiritual sledgehammer, but I want you to understand something. If you find yourself temporarily defeated in the midst of this pandemic, there is great hope because this reveals the hope of the world. I understand that the pandemic is difficult, and sometimes it can seem like a huge mountain to overcome, but we have a Savior that has already overcome the world. And if we're going to see our churches thrive through this pandemic, it's going to be because the pastors of the local churches recapture the passion and fire of leadership. And I want you to know you have it in you to lead your people through victoriously. In fact, probably more appropriate to say you have him in you to empower you to lead your people through this pandemic victoriously. And so why should this book set your soul on fire? I believe the Apostle Paul shows us three reasons here in verses 16 and 17. And I want to lay these truths on your heart. First of all, Scripture should set our soul on fire because it is inspired. Look at verse 16. Paul says, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Literally, this can be translated God-breathed. Paul says all Scripture is God-breathed. And so what he's telling us is that from Genesis to Revelation, we have the breathed-out Word of the living God, revealing His mind, His motives, and His mission. Carl F.H. Henry, the great scholar of the 20th century, was once quoted as saying this. He said, the greatest question of our day is not, is there a God? But rather, if there is a God, what has God said? For what God says is the only thing that will last for all of eternity. Folks, I want, you, I want to remind you of something this morning. This Bible does not contain the Word of God. It is the Word of God. And ultimately, a lack of certainty about the Bible will result in a lack of commitment to the Bible. And so if you find yourself discouraged this morning, let me remind you that you need a fresh infusion about the certainty of God's inspired word. I want you to notice the qualifier that Paul uses here. He says in verse 16 that some scripture is given by the inspiration of God. Is that what he says? No, he, say, he says most scripture is given by inspiration of God. No, no, no. He says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. That word all is translated from the Greek word pause, which means all, or it can be translated every. 
We'll see that word again here in this passage of Scripture. But we need to be reminded that all Scripture is breathed out by the living God. The same breath that God breathed into Adam, the first man, is the same breath that he has breathed into his Scripture. And that's why we can say with authority that it is alive and active. The Bible contains 66 books. How many of these books have been breathed out by God? All 66. The Bible contains 1,189 chapters. How many of those chapters have been breathed out by God? All 1,189. The Bible contains 557,849 words in the original uh, Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic languages. How many of those words have been breathed out by the living God? All of them. All of them. It doesn't matter what chapter you're in tomorrow, preacher or pastor. It is the breathed out word of God that can give life to people whose souls are parched during this season. You know, I go through a chapter of the Bible every single day during my quiet time. This morning, I was in first Chronicles chapter number seven. It'll just bless your heart to read that chapter. You know what it's about? It's nothing but a genealogy of six different <coughs> ancient <laughs> Israeli tribes. Issachar, Manasseh, Asher, Gad, Ephraim. I mean, six different tribes. That's all it is. Somebody begot so-and-so, and somebody begot so-and-so, and the sons of this guy are such and such and such and such. But you know what I found in that chapter? I'm telling you, folks, this revolutionized my life. This is why I'm up here. I'm excited. I mean, I'm, I'm telling you, you know, <laughs> uh, this is heavy stuff for me. If you realize where God brought me from, now I'm preaching the annual sermon at a Baptist association. Praise God. I, I thank God that I was in 1 Chronicles 7 this morning. It's just nothing but a genealogy. But you know what I found in 1 Chronicles 7? In fact, a better question is, who did I find? In 1 Chronicles chapter 7. I found Jesus Christ. I realized that the, uh, the tribes of Dan and Zebulun were omitted from that chapter. And I also realized that 1 Chronicles and 2 Chronicles, they're one book in the Hebrew Old Testament. And they're all the way at the very end of the Hebrew Old Testament. And you know what those genealogies are trying to communicate to us? It kind of reverts back to the beginning of the Old Testament where we see a prophecy about a serpent crusher that would come through humanity. And what those genealogies are telling us is that this is not the serpent crusher. This is not the serpent crusher. This is not the serpent crusher. And it makes way for Matthew in the New Testament to introduce the serpent crusher known as the Messiah of Israel, the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, you can find Jesus in every chapter of the Bible. And if you show up tomorrow and you don't preach the gospel from the text you present to your people, you're just letting the best of the Bible pass you by and pass them by. You can preach the gospel from every chapter. All scripture was divinely given to humanity through the verbal plenary inspiration of those original manuscripts. And because of that, we have to remember that Leviticus and Lamentations are just as inspired as Luke. I want to challenge you. You know, us pastors, we can get together and we're really good at sometimes telling one another, if it wasn't for my people, well, ministry would be a joy. And sometimes we blame the roadblocks and obstacles of ministry on our people, but sometimes we... We have to lead them from the overflow of what God is doing in us. We will never lead them beyond a point that we never reach ourselves. And so I want to ask you a question. Pointedly and honestly, when was the last time you sat down in the privacy of your prayer closet or in your study and you opened up the Bible and you just let the beauty of the book of Obadiah wash over your soul? If you're pastoring a church, would you be able to tell your people what the book of Zephaniah is about? If I were to ask you this morning, tell me, 
Why was the book of Haggai written? Could you tell your people? Don't complain about your people when there are things undone in your life and God has called you to be the spiritual leader of your people. Now that might be as much of a sledgehammer as I've become this morning, but I think it's a word that's worth stating. I believe that you're here this morning because you love the Lord and because you love his people. And sometimes the word is called to correct us and bring us to repentance, right? I'll tell you, one of the paradoxes of the Christian life is that when we are weak, then we are strong. You know, great supernatural strength comes through brokenness. And another paradox of the Christian life is that the way forward is the way backwards. If you want to grow as a pastor and reach unprecedented levels of uh, uh, faithful pastoral ministry, maybe one of the greatest things that you can do is just to spiritually revert back to the point in which you got saved. You know, sometimes familiarity with holy things can sometimes cause us to forget the sacredness of those things. But you know, they say Adrian Rogers was one of the greatest men in the history of the Southern Baptist Convention because he never got over what Jesus did in his life. And you know, I can remember when I was 13 years old, my grandfather was preaching a revival in Lexington, Kentucky, and during the invitation, I went up front, and I was so overwhelmed with conviction and emotion that I couldn't even tell him why I came up front, but he knew. And he said, do you want to be saved? I said, yeah. And I knelt down at the altar, and I want you to know that I didn't just shed a few crocodile tears. I stained that carpet with my tears. And I still stand amazed to this day that Jesus was willing to do that for me. And every person lost in darkness and entangled and ensnared in sin can have the same hope that I have. And what amazes me even more about the gospel now than 27 years ago is that I've done a lot more repenting since I got saved and even since I surrendered to ministry than before. And yet, God still forgives me. I love 2 Timothy 2.13. Even when we are faithless, He remains faithful, for He cannot be false to Himself. And uh, the Bible reveals to us this beautiful gospel. And Scripture is marginalized in the life of any Christian or any church leader who fails to both understand its essence and utilize its entirety. Pastor, preach the whole word and let it set your soul on fire because it is inspired. As we move on to the second part of verse 16, we see a second reason why this book should set our souls on fire. It's because Scripture is not only inspired, but also because it is instructive. Look at what he says in verse 16. He says, it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. And so what Paul's telling us is that everything you need to know concerning God can be found in the Bible. Everything from sin, salvation, and sanctification to marriage, ministry, and missions. The Bible is sufficient in its revelation of what we need to know. But I think it's important for us to also know the Bible is not exhaustive in its revelation. The Bible doesn't tell us everything about everything. You say, now hold on a second. That almost sounds, that sounds suspect, Brother Ed. Well, let me remind you. How many of you all took difficult courses in high school or college? Anybody? I remember being a senior in high school. I took AP Calculus. Man, that was a hard class. That was a hard class. Uh, I mean, I remember uh, getting uh, my second master's degree. Um, business accounting just about blew my mind. Now, I'll tell you. It would have been awesome if, as a senior in high school, I could have cracked the Bible open to the book of Psalms and learned about the dynamics of nuclear physics 
or learned about the dynamics of AP calculus, or it would have been nice when I was uh, in that business accounting class if I could have cracked the Bible open to Proverbs and learned the wisdom of business accounting, but the Bible doesn't have any authorial intent. And that we need to know about spiritual thriving this side of heaven. The Bible is sufficient in its revelation of what we need to know about God, predominantly things like his creative power and things like his covenant promises. You know, speaking about this very text before us, Dr. Adrian Rogers once said, the Bible will tell you what is right, it'll tell you what is wrong, it'll tell you how to get right, and it'll tell you how to stay right. The Bible is an instructive tool that helps us dig and drill right down into the core of God's very being. And Scripture is profitable because it aligns us to four essential aspects of Christian living that can also be applied to our lives as church leaders. Notice what Paul says those four things are. He says doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness. And so Paul tells us here that the Bible is first of all a tool for revelation. Look at what he says, doctrine. That tells us what is right. The Bible is a tool that reveals to us what is right. Let me remind you this morning. It doesn't matter what the culture says is right. It doesn't matter what the next presidential candidate of the United States or vice presidential candidate says about what is right. It doesn't matter what your church committees say, and it doesn't even matter what people's personal perspectives or feelings are. What tells us what is right, the standard for making decisions, is the Word of God. It is our only guide. For faith and practice. The Bible is a tool for revelation. The Bible is also a tool for rebuke. Now, we like to hear what's right, but we don't always like to hear what's wrong. I want to camp out here for just a second because this word reproof means proof or persuasion or conviction. And Paul's reminding us that whenever we run afoul of the holiness of God, Whenever we sin and fall short of his glory, the Holy Spirit is going to use the truth revealed in the word of God to bring us under conviction and to remind us that you're going the wrong direction. The Holy Spirit's going to press that sore spot and hear something that is lost. I'm going to tell you, this may be what I, at least I perceive. This is my opinion. I can't necessarily prove this. Uh, infallibly from the word of God but I'm telling you this may be the recipe that we need to combat as leaders in our churches because the modern church has lost the dynamic of rebuke by and large I'll tell you this you know just like I told you earlier when I was giving the report on the gospel every home I grew up in Winchester and uh, you know when my parents were together until the age of 14 there was some level of stability and security in my home. But whenever my parents separated and eventually divorced, uh, I just lived with one of my parents. And the parent that I lived with, anything went. Anything. I mean, that, there was nothing that was off the table. I could come home stumbling, drunk, and uh, just laugh at me. And uh, there just wasn't a lot of structure and order. And um, eventually, doing what I wanted to do and doing what I felt like doing became a bottomless pit. And I ended up hitting rock bottom. But do you know what I found at the bottom of that pit? There's a rock down there. And his name is Jesus. And nowadays, whenever somebody stands in front of me and they say, Brother, you need to watch out for this or that. I see this in your life. Here, now, here's what I would have done maybe 25 years ago. Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? You mind your own business and just you, you stay in your corner. Now, I don't hear that nowadays. I know what it's like to just be left on my own to do what I want to do. And when I make these decisions or choices based on how I feel, I ended up messing everything up. But now when somebody says, watch out, you're going the wrong direction, I thank God that somebody cares enough about my life to want to rebuke me and align me with the 
the truth of Scripture. Isn't that what we need? And let me ask you, church leader, do you have anyone in your family, and particularly in your spiritual family, that has permission to do that? If you don't, it's a recipe for disaster. I'm not just talking about a recommendation. I'm talking about a convictional, essential element of faithful ministry. Because if you, if you don't surround yourself with anyone who has permission to rebuke you and correct you, then really it's just all on you. And I'm telling you, you may not realize that that is arrogant leadership. Because I've learned that I can't trust my heart. What does the Bible say about my heart in Jeremiah 17? Deceitful. It's deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? And so we need people who are willing to uh, rebuke us on the basis of God's word. Now, I'm not talking about rebuking us in light of preferences. You know, I, I don't care whether you get green carpet or red carpet for the sanctuary. It doesn't matter. I don't care a hill of beans about that. I mean, there are people who can make it look good. Just make it look good. But I'm talking about essential, clear revelation from the word of God. We need to become people who are willing to receive rebuke. And that takes humility and teachability. You know, I, I've had the privilege of serving as a director of missions uh, in an association uh, in West Virginia. And, um, you know, I had the privilege during my time there of hiring two staff members. And the Lord taught me things through that. And you know what I learned? I make hiring decisions not so much on the basis of talent, but on the basis of teachability. If somebody's got it all figured out, if there's somebody who uh, has arrived and you can't tell them anything, <laughs> I can't have them on the team. We've got to have an understanding that there's mutual collective accountability. Rebuke is a beautiful thing. And I'm going to go out on a limb here and just say that there's ev every single person in this place today probably has multiple areas of their life, not only where they can be rebuked, but where they need to be rebuked. And you know what? It's a beautiful thing when God shows his lovingness as a father and says, I love you too much to leave you in error. The Bible tells us that whom the Lord loves, he chastens. A good father learns how to punish his children. And so we need to listen to the corrective voice of our father. The Bible is a tool for rebuke. It's used by the Holy Spirit to convict us and rebuke us when we do wrong. But we don't have to stay wrong. The Bible will tell us how to get right. It's also a tool for restoration. It's a tool for revelation. It's a tool for rebuke. And it's a tool for restoration. Uh, the word correction here carries the connotation of setting something right again. The Bible is a tool that guides repentant sinners toward restored fellowship with God. You know, there may need to be some relationships in your life that are restored. Um, there may need to be some uh, areas of rebellion and sin in your life that need to be restored. The beautiful thing about the gospel is that God honors genuine repentance instantly. Isn't that a good thing? I'll tell you, um, my wife and I closed on a half house this week. I just kind of tell people, you know, uh, about my life. And uh, I just kind of don't leave anything on the table. God already knows about it, so it really doesn't matter to me whether you like it or not. He affirms me through the blood of Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter if anybody else does. But uh, we closed on a house this week, and I tell you, it was like pulling teeth. The numbers on the closing sheet were wrong. Uh... The communication with the closing agency was just off the wall, and I just about had to get, you ever just get teeth gritty mad? And you're like, look, you've got one job. You do this for a living. How do you get the numbers wrong? So no, nobody here is like, you never get frustrated, I don't guess, do you? I do. Um, and so I just, man, I got mad, and finally we signed the closing papers. 
And I had one thing left to do, call my insurance company and cancel my mortgage insurance. I thought this was going to be the easiest thing that I had done all week. It was not. Called the insurance company. They said, yeah, let me transfer you to the area. And uh, the phone rang literally, I'm not kidding, five minutes. And then I got cut off. And this company prides itself on customer service. <laughs> so I call back. And I'm on the phone and they're like, well, you can't just tell us that you want to cancel your insurance. We got to have it in writing. I had it. You know what I did? I threw my phone on the ground. Surely not you. You're the preacher. Yes, I threw my phone on the ground. And you know who saw me do it? My wife. And guess what? 30 minutes after I threw my phone, I had a meeting scheduled on the calendar with two guys in Woodford County that I was helping with the gospel to every home. Now, this is Tuesday, folks. No, this is uh, Thursday. This is just two days ago. Two days ago. Um, and so I pick my phone up. I walk out the door and say, look, I'm leaving. Bye, Emily. And I'm driving down the road. And do you know what the Holy Spirit did? He pressed on the sore spot. But I have learned that that discomfort is meant for my good. My wife didn't need to see me throw a temper tantrum. That lady on the phone did not need to see me throw a temper tantrum. And I'll just tell you, the pride in my heart grieved because I blew it. But you know what was amazing about that? God reminded me that if you will just repent, I will make everything right again. And so what I did is I was driving down the road on the way to that meeting. I said, Lord, I just pray that you'll forgive me. I bring nothing to the table. I have nothing to offer. But I'm asking that you will change my heart and forgive me. And then after I did that, I communicated with my wife and I said, I'm sorry. I, text, I, mean, I texted it out. I said, I repent and I ask you to forgive me. And you know what she said? She said, I forgive you. And you know what? I was able to show up to that meeting after having a temper tantrum. And I was able to lead with spiritual purity. Not because I'm sinless, but because he has made me sinless. And this is the beauty of preaching the word of God because we've got people showing up every Sunday who are stained with sin and their souls are parched from the dirtiness of this world and we have the one solution we can give them. And we ought to be able to lead out of that. When was the last time you experienced authentic repentance in your personal life? It ought to be a regular thing. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 31, I if we're gonna, if we're gonna be pure vessels before a holy God, repentance ought to be a regular part of our personal devotional life. Yes. And so, the Bible is a tool for restoration. Um, a broken and contrite heart, O oh Lord, Thou wilt not despise. Now, if I'm trying to stand in the power of my own strength, God's gonna set His face against me. But when I realize I'm nothing apart from Him. Then I become acceptable in his sight. And so the Bible is a tool for restoration. And then lastly, the Bible is a tool for righteousness. This phrase, instruction in righteousness, carries the connotation of discipline for remaining on the right path. And so once we restore fellowship with God, theoretically, we never have to get off course ever again. We can remain in fellowship. We can walk in righteousness and purity before him. The Bible is a tool that keeps us on the right path and shows us how to remain in intimate connection with a holy God. Now, the Bible being a tool for revelation, rebuke, restoration, and righteousness. These four dynamics inform not only our bibliology, but they also inform our Christology. 
Put another way, Paul is not only telling us here about the written word, he is also telling us about the living word. You know, the very first article of the Baptist Faith and Message is on what topic? Scripture. And the very last uh, sentence in Article 1 of the Baptist Faith and Message 2000 says, All Scripture is a testimony to whom? Jesus Christ, who is himself the focus of divine revelation. And so Paul uses the written word here to tell us something about the living word. Because I want you to know in Jesus Christ, we see the ultimate revelation of God. Because only in the person of Christ do we know what is right. In Jesus Christ, we see the ultimate rebuke to sinful humanity. Because all of us place the most valuable person in human history on the cross of Calvary. In Jesus Christ, we see the ultimate restoration because in him and him alone can we be restored as sinners into righteous fellowship with the Holy God. And in Jesus Christ, we see the ultimate righteousness because only through him can our souls be imputed with the perfect standard to enter the gates of heaven. Jesus Christ is the ultimate revelation of the scriptures. And Paul shows us about him as the living word and talking about the written word. There's an old poem that uh, tells us about this dynamic. I find my Lord in the Bible wherever I chance to look. He is the theme of the Bible, the center and heart of the book. He is the rose of Sharon. He is the lily fair. Wherever I open my Bible, the Lord of the Bible is there. He at the book's beginning gave to the earth its form. He is the ark of shelter, bearing the brunt of the storm. The burning bush of the desert, the budding of Aaron's rod. Wherever I look in the Bible, I see the Son of God. The ram upon Mount Moriah, the ladder from earth to sky, the scarlet cord in the window, and the serpent lifted high. The smitten rock in the desert, the shepherd with staff and crook, the face of my Lord I discover wherever I open the book. He is the seed of the woman, the Savior virgin born. He is the son of David, whom men rejected with scorn. His garments of grace and beauty, the stately Aaron deck, yet he is a priest forever, for he is Melchizedek. He's Lord of eternal glory, whom John in a vision saw, Light of the golden city, lamb without spot or flaw. Bridegroom coming at midnight, for whom the virgins look. Wherever I open my Bible, I find my Lord in the book. Every single spot of scripture is saturated with revelation about the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the Bible should set your soul on fire, not only because it is inspired, but also because it is instructive. Lastly, uh, Paul says that Scripture should set our souls on fire because it is irreplaceable. Look at what he says in verse 17. That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, uh, Paul tells us two things here about the irreplaceability of Scripture. First of all, he says that uh, the Bible empowers you with maturity. Now, you may have the King James Version, and it says that the man of God may be perfect. Your translation may also say complete. Uh, it may also say mature. Uh, but that Greek word is uh, artios, which means fitted or ready. It's a word that carries the connotation of maturity as a result of preparation. And so the word complete or perfect is uh, a word that uh, Paul is integrating with Scripture. There's no way that you and I can have the maturity required for gospel ministry apart from the Word of God. Right. I mean, I'm looking out here and I see a lot of different pastors. I know that there are some of you all who are serving at churches and there are people in that church that hate your guts. Now, I know that I hope that's not everyone in your congregation. But that's a reality of ministry. You know, when I was at DOM in uh, Upper Ohio Valley, uh, there was one pastor. I mean, I'm not talking about a church member. There was a pastor of a church who hated my guts. And um, 
it was a very refining time in my life because it turned into an opportunity. The opportunity, isn't that the gospel? Isn't that the gospel? The only way that you can cultivate that kind of maturity for ministry is to remain tethered to the Word of God. It's going to be the Word of God that transforms you. So only by saturating your soul with the Word of God are you going to be able to love your enemies and turn the other cheek and pursue perfection as your Father in Heaven is perfect. It's going to be the Word of God that equips you for uh, that level of maturity. You see, we need maturity if we're going to effectively pastor the saints that God has given us stewardship over. Here's why this is important. If all you have to offer people as a pastor is your giftedness and your talent and your charisma and your ability, there's nobody in your church that will ever be changed. Nobody. Because what I have to offer is nothing. I, you know, I might be able to stand behind a pulpit and get fired up and wound up and, and have a little bit of fire, but you know what? The, the power of ministry is not in the way you do ministry. It's the tools that God gives you for ministry. And I'll tell you what, the Word of God is a lot more powerful, thank God, than uh, any sort of effort that I can make, right? And so we want people to be supernaturally changed, and we need the Bible because it's the only tool that carries Jesus Christ's instilled power. It is the Word that is living and active. And then not only does the Bible empower you with maturity, the Bible equips you for ministry. Paul says that it makes the man of God thoroughly equipped for every good work. That word every is a familiar word. We've already talked about it. It's translated from the Greek word pra or cause, which means all. All scripture. Pause scripture. Equips you for all ministry. It is scripture that will equip you for every good work. If you want to know how to do the ministry that you've been called to, you will find the primary textbook is the Word of God. You don't need the next Lifeway resource or the next purpose-driven theory. Nothing wrong with those things. I thank God for those things. But if your primary guidebook and textbook is not the Word of God, you might as well hang it up. It is the Word of God that will equip us for all ministry. You know, Wayne Grudem summarizes the, summarizes the doctrine of Scripture with this conclusion. He says... The sufficiency of Scripture means that Scripture contained all the words of God He intended His people to have at each stage of redemptive history, and that it now contains all the words of God we need for salvation, for trusting Him perfectly, and for obeying Him perfectly. You know, uh, when I was a student at Clear Creek Baptist Bible College, I had the privilege of uh, meeting a, a man who pastored in Middlesbrough, Kentucky. His name was Mitch Bradshaw. And uh, Mitch pastored the East Cumberland Avenue Baptist Church in Middlesboro. Uh, Mitch and I uh, shared the uh, privilege of being able to preach at a uh, Christian school uh, in a somewhat nearby area. Uh, it was called Fondy Christian Academy. It was a kindergarten through 12th grade Christian Academy that had a grand total of 18 students. And uh, growing up as a good Winchester boy, I knew that there were three levels to the country. Uh, there's the country, and then there's the sticks, and then there's the boonies. <laughs> Fondy was out in the boonies. And uh, Mitch uh, had the privilege of preaching there uh, before I did. And so I told him, tell me how it turns out. Well, here's how it turned out. He got into his uh, vehicle on the day he was supposed to preach there. He plugged in Fondy's address, and uh, he set out and drove. He got about halfway there, and he's in the middle of the sticks getting ready to go into the boonies. And his GPS system on his vehicle goes blank. And then all of a sudden on the screen, there pops up a question mark. 
And his GPS asks him and says, where are you? <laughs> Can you believe that? I mean, that thing was supposed to tell him where he was located. And uh, it just goes to show us, you know, the best man-made devices will ultimately fail you. But God has given us a divine tool known as the Word of God that has never failed and it never will fail. If you go into the pulpit tomorrow and you show up to church tomorrow and your focus is on the unadulterated Word of God, my friend, you are guaranteed success eternally. And that ought to set your soul on fire. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your uh, word this morning. I thank you for these men and women and uh, just grateful for um, their faithfulness and uh, their desire to serve you and the love that they have for you and for your people. Uh, Lord, we love you. We thank you that you first loved us. Uh, Father, if there is uh, anything undone in our hearts, if we have just uh, gotten used to the reality that we are saved by grace and that grace has become familiar and we've lost the awe of the gospel or we have lost uh, the conviction uh, or lost passion about the word of God, a dual work in our hearts that can only be explained by your supernatural power and your divine goodness. Uh, Lord, we open up our hearts now and ask you to search us and uh, bring us to the place where we will be able to minister effectively tomorrow and each day hereafter because we ultimately want to do it for your glory. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.